Welcome. This is Davos 2020, and it's been an exciting year. It's an exciting part of our journey because last year we were very kindly given so much hospitality by some of the great resources that the World Economic Forum brings together. One of chief of, amongst them, from my perspective, was uh, uh, one of our guests here, Henrietta, who is, um, besides being the executive director of UNICEF, Henrietta Four is a YPO herself, and I want to come on to that in, in a moment, as is Fleur Haynes, who is, again, an inspirational person. that will tell you a little bit about her story. And I would just like to say that it's just, this has nothing to do with the panel, but just a little YPO uh, insert. So, so a lot of us are in forums, and we know that there are very strict rules in forum. You can't be related to anybody in a forum. You can't have any conflict of interest. You can't do business with anybody in a forum. Well, in, in Henrietta's case, uh, she kind of broke all the rules by marrying somebody in her forum. So, but, but, but it's good, it's 30 years, and still, so, so it would be lovely to hear about that. And Henrietta, thank you again for coming back one more time, and this time to having a little bit more depth, and Fleur for joining us for the first time. And we are really here to participate and to hear what are the things that we as YPOers, and most of us are not in the world of philanthropy or NGOs, most of us running businesses. But there's a big agenda out there. There's some frightening things that we're hearing, and we cannot sit on the sidelines anymore. So in our 70-year history, we've never taken the step to engage as deeply as we are this year, where we're saying our membership needs to hear that there is a major, there are many major issues that we need to address. And UNICEF has been historically and currently doing so many amazing things. I don't know how many things YPO as, as business leaders can engage in, but maybe you can share some of that and, and Fleur, some calls to action, some ideas, some suggestions, and then we'll go into a little bit of a conversation towards the end. So Fleur, if you'd like to kick it off, and thank you both very much. Thank you very much, Maurice. And Henrietta, it's a real honor to be sitting next to you on the stage. It's a treat for me too, Fleur. So, um, I mean, it's very interesting what Maurice just said in the YPO context. Um, I just was with the Deal Network board um, in Dallas, and I am now their impact investment specialist. So, Perfect. So things are moving on. Um, and I think the reason why they did that is because um, this new YPO 3.0 version includes two words. Uh, one is to be impactful, and the other one is relevance. And I think maybe that would be a great thing to kick off with because you, at UNICEF, it's such a beacon of an organization. Um, how do you position yourself in terms of impactfulness and relevance in this day and age? Well, that's a small question, Fleur. <laughs> uh, well, all right. So uh, for those of you who do not yet know, uh, UNICEF is 70 years old. We are in every country in the world. 20,000 people strong. We look after young people and children between the ages of zero and 18. There are a little under three billion of them. So we have lots to do. We work in education and nutrition and health and water and sanitation and protection and everything in between. So uh, it's an organization. You run it just like a YPO com company. It is your people that are your greatest asset but the systems are that of the United Nations, which can sometimes be a challenge. But one of our challenges is that we do not carry financing. We are, uh, we are deal flow. We have lots and lots, thousands of projects, but we don't carry financing. So as a result, it means that in the international world, we need to link in with the World Bank, the European Development Banks, all of the uh, financial systems and markets in the world so that we can actually move our programs. We have lots of programs on the ground in which we are working with governments. Our board is made up of countries, so uh, member states. So our board is 35 strong. You can imagine what it's like when you have rotating board members from countries. Uh, but that is our group. And um, we are one-third privately funded, two-thirds publicly funded. 
We have to raise our funds every year, so we are just like a corporation. We are about $7 billion a year, so we have a big budget that we have to raise. We probably touch a quarter of the children and young people in the world. That's not enough. We need to touch another quarter. So I can tell you uh, about some of the programs. There's a lots of opportunity for YPO. But one of the things that I have noticed with um, our YPO companies is that often we are so local. We're in our own communities. And we are important in our communities. And we're important to our own employees. And we make a difference with our customers. Um, in the world, there are some big ideas that are moving. So to your point about relevance, the World Economic Forum is a very interesting place for a YPO to come and to see who else is thinking about ideas in your industries or in your space, who you could partner with, as the techies always say, who to play with. <laughs> um, but as a result, it means that it's a place where you can do business and you can get ideas for your heads and your heart. So the WEF this year chose two subjects. One was reskilling revolution, which is one that UNICEF has been at the heart of. Um, so that's one. And then the second one is that of planting a trillion trees. And that's climate. And who's leading climate? It's the young. So these are two really important issues. They are front and center for UNICEF. And that's part of how you become relevant and important in the world discussions, yeah. is that you're onto the topics of the day, in addition to having your long-term 30-year, mm -hmm. 70-year plans. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right, so that was a bit long, but uh, no, it, it's it, wonderful to be here, Fleur. It's, it's great. So, I mean, the reason why I ask is because um, we started a company called Proof of Impact, and it was really responding to two very big needs that we see to get to scale because, you know, there's a trillion dollars being given away each year, or roughly the numbers, from public and private sectors, which is a lot of money. And the uh, criticism has been from some of the cynics is that that money is not always effectively spent. And that in a day and age where as a donor or as a consumer, you get transparency on everything, the product experience of giving a donation is not as great as we see in some other products that particularly the, the millennial consumer is expecting. So we think that there is room for a variety of players, right? So you have the established big brands like UNICEF, but again, then comes the other need. They can only fund normally quite established programs. And sometimes the innovation comes from the new kids on the block. And for them to get three years of financial track record, you know, is not really in anyone's interest. So what we at Proof of Impact try to do is complement your work by saying, okay, if there are from the ground up initiatives that can already prove using technology and in a verifiable way what, they, what impact they're having. So you brought up the examples of trees. Every tree that gets planted can be verified, right? With photographs, with geotagging, with satellite images. And then we could sell that directly to the donor and the donor has this engaged experience. But how would we kind of collectively use sort of our more agile, innovative approach and your scale to move some of these things forward? Ultimately, any large organization is a composition of small organisms. Mm -hmm. So your entrepreneurial group is what we have at country level everywhere. Mm -hmm. So this is a very easy match. Um, we interact with private companies in a couple of different ways. One is that we are a purchaser, so we purchase um, half the vaccines in the world, for instance. Um, another way that we, we interact is that we become partners on a project. So let's say you and I see a new mobile incubator that we think could be used in refugee camps. Mm -hmm. And you say, would you all be interested? And we say, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So then we decide, mm -hmm. are you manufacturing? Do we need to go ask somebody else to do it? Could we put it in the camps? And we do. And so we, then we join our people power mm -hmm. on the ground. We get it into the camp. Mm -hmm. Another way that you might mm -hmm. interact with us is on intellectual capital. Mm -hmm. So did that mobile incubator, did that actually work? Why did it work? Uh, how much um, um, energy did it take? Mm -hmm. So how to assess, how to measure, is a very big issue now in the world. And so we, we also partner on intellectual capital. Mm -hmm. But 
it, um, large organizations, I, I know many of you have them, they're very entrepreneurial. And so uh, YPOers, this is, this is your milieu, this is it. It's, um, it's creation, it's innovation, it's connections, it's partnerships, it's let's do something together. Yeah, and I, and I think maybe that's sometimes a side that people don't always see or experience. Um, but I think that is the opportunity. And I think one other thing for YPO that's really important, we really believe that corporates are kind of now at the center point of moving the impact needle because they're getting pressure from their consumers, right, to show not only, you know, what products they're producing, but also what is their contribution to society. And blindly giving away money again to some charity without those data points, again, the consumer won't accept. At the same time, voters are putting pressure on regulators to say to the companies, okay, you need to measure your footprints, especially from an environmental perspective. So, the companies have money, right? And if it becomes in their interest, both commercially and from an investability perspective, to improve their footprint by buying, we call it buying rather than donating or investing, by buying proven impact, right, at scale, everybody kind of wins. So what is UNICEF doing uh, to engage? So you said one third of your money comes from private sources, how much of that actually comes from companies, and, and how visible is their funding, or how, how do they know what they've impacted? So um, in our world, private means both an individual, it might be your mother or, your, um, or yourself who's giving you know, $10 a month uh, to UNICEF. We also have corporations, and corporations, interestingly enough, also have a very big part of their interest in getting their employees engaged in what we do because you know this new generation. They want to have an impact. They want to be part of it. They want to actually work in the programs and projects. Mm -hmm. So we find there's quite a bit of engagement there. And then um, we also have foundations. So mm -hmm. personal foundations are also, so they're all our private, sec mm -hmm. private side of donations. But corporations are actually fairly small, and part of it is that I don't think corporations know how to uh, react to the United Nations. We have regulations, there's no doubt about it. It's like working with any of your national governments. And, um, and we're not as fast, but once you're in, you're in for years to come, so it's worth spending some time on it. Uh, but, it, but you don't have to be a, a, um, a purveyor of services. You can be a partner, which is very fast, mm -hmm. because you can agree to do things together. Um, and fast in the United Nations is? Well, you know, for, for some things, I mean, like, we work in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and we had not expected to have Ebola cases. Mm. When Ebola hit, we were out within an hour, mm -hmm. out on motorbikes trying to get um, information up into the villages. Yeah. I mean, so it, um, it we can do things within an hour, <laughs> but we can also take a year or two to do things. So you know, it, it um, you have to have patience. Uh, you have to know that there's a bigger, greater goal out there. You probably have to have a bit of um, philanthropy in your heart that you're doing this for a bigger purpose. Mm -hmm. But when you do. Uh, it's worth the wait. It's, it's worth the wait. And, and when you do, you move um, help for millions yeah. of children and young people. So you feel good about it later. And to your point earlier about how do you get back to them, we try to always measure. We try to always get back to people about what the programs are. But if we have a corporate partner, it's just as wonderful if they're working out in the field with us. So then you know immediately what the impact is. And you can begin innovating together. So you can say, well, this seems to be working. Like um, we use therapeutic foods for um, trying to address wasting and stunting in children. That's a big supply chain. But maybe we could make a local um, formula that could use uh, local provision of cereals within that or, you know, nut pastes that might be better for that particular country. We, we just announced this morning we were going to be working in the Sahel and in the Horn of Africa on this. So sometimes these are in very conflict-ridden, mm -hmm. difficult situations. But if you have patience, if you have an interest in doing something good in the world, we're a great spot to do it. We work in other places too, but you know, mm. uh, if if in the hardest of places, 
you'd like to have a partner like a UNICEF that's been there for many years and is sort of a, a steady part of the local community. No, no, I understand. And I think you touched on something else, which, which is a nice segue into what I want to get to in terms of impact investing. So you mentioned, you know, maybe some of the initiatives could improve the economic development, right, of certain areas. And I think that's super important to really get upliftment because, you know, there is a, you know, a, a theory that we have to move from aid to trade, right? And that some solutions could be solved for in a more commercial way. And therefore, this whole drive towards this impact investing trend, I mean, it's partly because the investor feels that, you know, they want to see that they do something good with their money and they don't just want to give it away because they still want that return. Um, but it's also on the project side. So I saw a in very interesting company in India called Industry. Have you heard of them? So for those who don't know, it's a foundation which has 30,000 women that they skill and employ, but they have a factory where they track the actual working conditions, the, wa the wages that are paid to the staff, and then they basically um, supply goods to IKEA, right? So they actually have a funding deficit each year because IKEA, surprise, surprise, only pays like three months after they've received the product, and those operating cash flow cycles are really hurting this company. So if you think about it, this, they are employing and skilling women, SDG5, right? They are creating jobs. If we can get them to scale, right, on a commercial basis by creating an impact investment product that addresses that short-term capital need, that seems to be very fundamental, sustainable funding, for lack of a better word. Is, is the sort of move to impact investing, I mean, that's one model which is market-driven, which is kind of easier to solve, but there's also another model which could be donor-driven, where people like UNICEF could become outcomes funders. So they don't actually deploy their own resources to do the work in the field, other possible, more efficient operators could do that. But if the outcome is achieved, then UNICEF would pay investors who have paid for the operating cash flow, and I'm going into detail here, but I think you're following me, they could pay them back. And if we could create such products, the demand for that is unsatiable. Like, there is such a demand for that. Yes, so uh, I th this link of how finance moves in the development and humanitarian space is a very big puzzle. And there are some who are here, even today, who have some answers for that. So this might be a good area for a YPO cluster or mm -hmm. group. Um, I, I also think that uh, coming out of the WEF, there might be a group that m might be interested in having a, a, a small circle. Like a working session around yes. this. Um, so your comment about um, the group in India, so industry, can do a forward financing module. Mm -hmm. uh, for others, it is um, a collecting a group of outcomes from poor individuals um, to be able uh, for us to move programs. We move programs through lots of local nonprofit organizations and lots of international nonprofit organizations. We do some ourselves, some through the local governments, but we use lots of partners and our mission is to try to get the governments to be able to do it themselves and with nonprofits. So we try to bolster everyone uh, and move ourselves out of doing the work because you want the world to be able to operate without us and you want business to be able to do it. Um, but that whole uh, sequence requires that there are results that someone will pay on and that they're verifiable and that they are results that are aggregated in a large enough size that somebody wants to fund it. So usually what we find is that a donor will say that they want someone to verify the results and then they will pay on it. We are not allowed to use our internal fund funding for that that comes from governments. So that two thirds of our budget cannot be used for that. Then the one third that's given by other donors, we'd have to ask them if they'd like to do that. But it's more likely that it would be a social impact investment vehicle that would fund your wonderful programs, uh, UNICEF, and more programs that would be in a sphere, let's say, helping girls and women 
uh, who are the strength of many societies, and uh, that, you, that you really help their programs and projects. Mm -hmm. So I think, it's, I think it's a very interesting and very important discussion. There's lots of uh, funding that does not connect with the projects. Exactly. And I think that's the, so we, we've kind of gone through, from a finance and impact perspective, we've gone through impact investing version 1.0, which was microfinance, where you had both impact and some financial upside. Then we've gone to a flurry of investment activity in these impact funds, right, where people are using traditional investment products and applying it to impact. We're not quite sure about the results of that yet. But with technology and the ability to track data real time, we think that there is now the possibility of a version 3.0 where we connect impact events to funding. It could be both donation and investment product in a live fashion. And I think that is going to be the tipping point to reach scale. So, I mean, coming back to you, what do you see as the levers that you would have to use to go from, what did you say, 7 billion per year? To, I mean, we're, we're talking about a gap of five to seven trillion. What do you see as the opportunities that could really, you know, make you grow in your activity significantly? Well, one would be in education. Um, one of the things that you see when you move around the world is that the health area has a very interesting international architecture for funding, given the Global Fund and Gavi and others. So what happens there does not happen in education. Mm -hmm. So Correct. one opportunity would be on education. One of the reasons that many girls do not go to secondary school is that their parents do not see a reason for them to go. They're not learning anything that would be useful and therefore they don't pay the tuition. Mm -hmm. Well, we want girls and boys to go to secondary school. Mm -hmm. So couldn't we have a fund that helped those parents mm -hmm. to pay the mm -hmm. tuition and the impact would be that they showed up at school and learned something. And we think that's a possibility. It hasn't been mm. done, but we think would be very possible. Climate is a very interesting one for us because we see droughts throughout the world. We see flooding throughout the world. So climate-based funding, I think, could work. Health-based funding, I mentioned that we work in Democratic Republic of Congo uh, for Ebola, but we also now have a measles outbreak there. So. Could we have pegged it against when you get the first or the second measles outbreak? Would that then be how, let's say, a cat bond would pay? So we have, we have lots of areas that we could do. We, we also have um, a whole different group that can be financed differently, where we do water and sanitation systems all yeah. over the world. That's an infrastructure funding. It doesn't have to be impact, could be. So there are lots of varieties uh, that one can do, and one can choose almost anything. And when you look at the world that we work in, mm -hmm. I think that the financing vehicles are the major issue to get over the hump for us. Mm -hmm. And at least I know from our projects, we don't have the people who can translate them into business deals. Mm -hmm. Now, you might, but you may also need that help. So you're a good funnel into us. We could help you because we'd be like a big mm -hmm. sister organization. But we could use help from businesses that they might be able to write some of the business plans mm -hmm. that they'd be interested then in investing in, or that they'd be interested in do offering some sort of a product or service. I mean, we can use lots of facilities. So think of us as, a, as an organization that we're a perfect pair with a YPO business or groups of businesses. Yeah, and I think I think the uh, the business models of the next 20 years will be very different from the business models we have seen to date. I mean, if you even look at the companies, the top 10 companies didn't even exist 15 years ago. So things are changing very rapidly, um, and I think that's also going to be a challenge and the friction of those faster moving companies interacting with some of the incumbents. Um, but actually, what, what did you read the book by Melinda Gates, Upliftments? No. Oh, it's actually really fascinating. You read it? Yeah. Because she talks about, and this comes back to the girls' education problem, she talks about this um, unpaid work. So 30% of the world's population, females, don't get paid for their work. That's the same in America, the Netherlands. You know, women tend to take over most of the household jobs. They tend to do more of the agricultural side, and they don't get paid. 
So it comes then back to the return on investment. If you are going to decide to send your boy or girl to school, if the girl isn't going to get paid anyway, why would you send her to school? So I thought rather than dealing with the symptom, if we could deal with the cause, right, and find funding to pay for, you know, the mother or the sister or, or you know, the wife that stays at home, you could break some models because then the return equation is completely different. I mean, is that something that you have considered or thought about? Yes, uh, in every country, and you're absolutely right on. So follow that thought. Okay, so that would be something that maybe we can explore together. So um, should we open it up for questions? Uh, Laura Koch, B. Wernan, what uh, really very inspiring, and I think what matters here is that what you have said might inspire many, many YPRs to come to Davos in the future. Uh, the question is um, uh, regarding UNICEF and education. So, uh, you know, education, reading, writing, and math are very important. Uh, but I think that has not been the solution to our society because uh, we are we see now that many of the kids might not be global citizen. Is a UNICEF also focusing on the importance in education on social emotional learning? Uh, you're made to be a UNICEFer. <laughs> so, um, so let me uh, mention a program that we, it's one of three that are big programs that I think would be wonderful for UNICEF, for YPO UNICEF. It's called Generation Unlimited, and it's for young people between the ages of 10 and 24. Uh, there's an internet site on it. Uh, it is every country in the world, and it is to try to raise a movement for these young people to get a modern education, which is what they're asking for, something that would be relevant to getting a job or a livelihood. So we're trying to connect education and skills. So this is the reskilling revolution outcome here at WEF. So um, we have a billion dollars from uh, the World Bank to try to work in the most difficult countries. We are asking for more corporations. One can do it in one's home country. We need mentors, internships, apprenticeships. We need um, any chance for a person who's working in your company or you to come teach for one session at a, at a secondary school just so that they can see what you do and uh, what your products and services are. The other thing that you teach when you do that is life skills. You teach how to talk to someone else who comes from a different walk of life. They need critical thinking, and they need to learn how to be entrepreneurs. So there are 1.8 billion of these young people in the world today. We need 10 million jobs a month. Now, you all know that we're not creating 10 million jobs a month. So a lot are going to have to be entrepreneurs. You all are the role models for that but we're going to have to inspire them and teach them and train them and mentor them. So they need to know how to have fun foundational skills, reading, writing. 60% right now of children who are in school do not have that basic capability, and a lot of it is Africa. And you know the demographics of Africa? Lots of young coming up. The biggest continent in the world. Yes. By 2030. And so you need foundational skills. You need those life skills extremely important. You need occupational skills. You need to know how to be an engineer or a nurse or how to repair a motorcycle or how to be a photographer. Uh, you also need digital skills in today's world. So we've got to teach all of that. We've got to do it before they're 18. And one of the reasons is because of mental health. So this year we have two new initiatives. One is mental health and one is climate. The mental health problems, uh, their number one is because of anxiety about not having a good education that's modern and not being able to get a job. They think we're in their jobs. We're never going to leave. There are too many of them, and they're really worried. They don't think that they've learned anything in school. They don't know how they're going to become a banker or anyone. So uh, they're, they're worried. The other thing they're really worried about is climate change. They think that we're leaving them a world that is um, uh, unclean and inoperable, and it's going to 
it's going to crash on them. So they have those two worries, and mental health is now a very, very big issue. So we've got a stream coming on for both um, young children in their first decade of life and also for adolescents in their second decade of life. Most um, of the um, mental health problems occur by the time you're age 14 or 15, and 75% you'll see by the age of 25. So if we can't catch it early, we can't catch it. And part of it is that you don't know what you're going to do in life. So this whole idea of being a mentor, of helping in the schools, we could really use you. So Generation Unlimited, any YPOer who could put up their hand and help in a country, we would love it. Great initiative. Hello, and Henrietta. It's good to see a chapter member uh, from Washington, D.C. Um, you answered most of my question. But the question was about mentorship. And now that you've opened up the subject, I'd like to know how we can formalize that. Because uh, YPO has put its heart in, 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 a, in a prominent place right now, where we're looking for impact um, and uh, recognizing, identifying members who are creating impact. But also, we have the 29,000 members with the ability to be mentors. And now, how do we go about formalizing something? You talked about a sister organization. Well, maybe we should find a way to actually make it happen. So any thoughts? <laughs> what a great idea. OK, so sister organization, that's great. So then why don't we think about that? So uh, so we'll, we'll come to work. OK, we've got a wink and a thumbs up. Yeah, so, so that would be very good. Another one might be um, uh, uh, springing off of your uh, work. We've been thinking about raising an innovation fund. We're not going to get to the sustainable development goals at the rate that we're moving. So we've got to get acceleration. It means that we need innovations. And they're happening in all of the YPO companies. But we don't know about them, and we will never be able to reach out. But if, let's say, a YPO -er or a chapter would have a group of younger entrepreneurs who are all working in their region or their towns or area, and they could mentor them, we could maybe have some innovations that we could then begin going to scale. And if some of them could be girls and women, they could be in technology, we'd be really excited. But they could be in any sector, because everything touches a young person's life. And one of the requests we've had this session at WEF is, is it possible for us to tag some products as being good for children or safe for children? Because there's so many toys that are out now, um, and drones, that y young want to get engaged with. So uh, how do we know if they're safe? Well, if YPOers could help us with some of these innovations in their local communities, and they could pull it up, we maybe could together raise some good innovation funds and also filter the ideas and give them some mentorship on how to grow a company. So that might be a second one. I have some ideas to follow up on. Okay, good. We're already at work. Justine. You're my hero. Every time I listen to you, I just feel like uh, the world is a better place because <laughs> of your ideas. But I have a question. I, I've been, I'm originally from Rwanda, and I've been in Afghanistan for 15 years. What is the disconnect between the great ideas from New York or whatever UNICEF is to the ground practices? Because what is really in interesting is that all those great ideas are needed. We are in Afghanistan. We are providing mentorship. I'm with my CEO here. <laughs> and uh, providing mentorship, apprenticeship, internship. And we have 3,500 people on our payroll. But that did not come easy, because we went into remote areas, finding to engage communities, because you know, Kabul is not Afghanistan, and Afghanistan is not Kabul. We are always thinking about people from rural areas, remote areas, because they need the, the help the most. But obviously, as, as much as we love UNICEF and other UN agencies, there is a great disconnect that needs to really broken down into reality. 
what is going on? What is the gap in between? Why are the things not happening the way you put them right there on the stage uh, so effectively? Let's, you know, let's get it done. <laughs> this is a woman after my own heart. So Justine, you've now become my hero. So you yes. come right on up here and take a, take a seat. All right, so you're doing something that it's hard for many companies to do because they won't see a profit in having 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people in the remote areas in Afghanistan. And I think everyone knows the demographics of today's world. All the young want to move to cities. They do not want to stay. Um, uh, they don't want to stay in subsistence farming. They don't want to be farmers. We're going to have to re-educate them. And those that are in the rural villages are part of this group that's not connected. So. Uh, right now, half of the world is connected to the internet, and the other half is not. So, when we look at that, we say, well, we're just struggling day to day just to get some of those families fed and trying to get the children in school and out of the fields so that they can get an education and they'll get a chance to actually think about how they can make do better at farming or anything else that they want to become. But then we said, so what's stopping that? And to us, as close as we can get to a silver bullet, it's education. So we think that if we could connect every school to the internet in the next three or four years, every school in the world to the internet, that they'd have a chance. Without it, I think our world is just going to keep the technology falling divide. apart. Yeah. So we think it's possible uh, with lower satellites, with some fiber optic companies, with some companies that are on the ground that could help us put up um, some receivers on every school. We need to map countries. President Kagame in Rwanda has been very much in favor of this. We uh, think that we're going to try to do what's called Gavi for gigabytes. So you know how we did it with Gavi. The um, they're the vaccine alliance. So half of the vaccines uh, come through UNICEF because we purchase in bulk. Thus, we create the market. We tell the, the pharmaceutical companies, we're going to need so many measles, diphtheria, et cetera. They then can buy at a reduced rate. It means it's good for the companies because they have um, very stable uh, markets that they're selling into. It's great for the countries because then they can be part of a cooperative. Why can't we do that for gigabytes? So we could become the aggregator and we could try to, to uh, gather the gigabytes. It would be financeable. The governments, so Paul Kagame in Rwanda, can buy that. We can get internet to every school. I think until you do that, there's going to be a disconnect in our world. Uh, and There's going to be so much inequality, and we don't know how to overcome it. But if we can get education, and then, of course, what we need is we need companies who do ed tech and who do job tech. So ed tech would be that you can bring education out into every school and then you can teach. Young people these days, they don't want a teacher in front of the classroom. They want to learn on their mobile phone what they, what they want to learn, when they want to learn it. And then they want to be connected to a job. So um, wh what could they do? Or how could they learn to be an entrepreneur? So if we can get them that, they've got to, they, I mean, we'll have Sorry. one world. But I think, I think this, the same thing you talked about innovation and UNICEF's role. So again, talking from experience, from colleagues and other people who are really in the innovation space. And because it's YPO and we can...